Hi, hello, howdy. Welcome to the Port of Los Angeles' annual STEM Fun Shop. Thank you for joining me on the STEM-filled adventure where we look at how science, technology, engineering, and math make themselves present every single day. During this event, we will highlight how several port divisions and port friends incorporate STEM into their jobs. I am John Yoon, your MC for today's virtual event. Now, first things first, happy Pi Day, everyone. Pi Day is just around the corner on March 14th. To celebrate, we have three civil engineers from the Ports Engineering Division who will be using STEM to create a compass from household items. Will they succeed? And what the heck is Pi Day? Let's find out. Hello, my name is Angela Ragusa and I'm a civil engineering associate for the Port of Los Angeles. Hello, my name's Jason Ho and uh, from the Port of Los Angeles. Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Leo. I'm a civil engineer for the uh, engineering division at the Port of Los Angeles. Happy Pi Day from the Port of Los Angeles. Pi is not only the ratio of a circle circumference to its diameter, but it exists in many mathematical and scientific applications. On this day, Pi Day, we would like to highlight Pi's influence in the world of STEM by demonstrating an activity from our STEM workbook. So today, we're gonna actually build a basic compass. The materials you'll need are sewing needle, a coin size cross section of a cork, a magnet, and a bowl of water. So first, we'll be taking a sewing needle and the magnet, and you will run one side of the magnet 30 times. Let's do it 30 times. One, two, Twenty-nine, thirty. All right. Then you're going to turn the magnet over and do the other side of the needle. One, thirty. All right. Thirty. So then we're going to center the needle on the cork. You need something that floats. If you don't have a cork, and place the cork and needle on the surface of the water. And it works better outside than indoors. You want to be away from metal if, if, if possible, because you'll get interference from anything metallic. And you'll see the, the magnet's rotating. It's orientating itself to the magnetic north. So you can see a move, and now it has finally pointed to a certain direction. So the sharp side is pointing to the left, to the right, and the, the other side is pointing to the left. If we look at our compass, our compass is north, is that way. It's to the left, and our needle is pointing to the left. I have a very expensive orienteering compass. And it also points north. Five degrees north. So, success! And it worked! Awesome, it worked! This is great. You too could build a mag magnetic compass at home. And now for Pi Day, we eat actual pie. So, uh, happy Pi Day. Happy Pi Day. Oh, this is the best part of Pi Day. <laughs> Thank you very much. Happy Pi Day! And again, happy Pi Day from the Port of Los Angeles. The best part of Pi Day is that you can go get a pie, a piece of pie. Big thank yous to Angela, Jason, and Leo for participating in our Pi Day video. You can find the compass making activity sheet in our STEM activity book, which is available on our event page. You can find a link in the description below. Next on our STEM adventure is our friends at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. At the southernmost part of the port, the aquarium is a public aquarium whose mission is to inspire exploration, respect, and conservation of marine life right here in Southern California. Let's see how STEM shows up for the aquarists, scuba divers, and veterinarians who work for the aquarium.
everyone to the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. My name's Lindsay. I'm an aquarist here at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. And one of my jobs is to do something really fun, is to feed all of the animals in our entire aquarium. So I'm going to introduce you guys to some of the food items that we feed in this tank. One of those food items is this guy right here. This is a market squid. We also have something that you might recognize. You might eat this very often. This is shrimp. So we have some shrimp for these guys. And then lastly, something you might not recognize um, as easily, this kind of yellow stuff right here, kind of orangish golden color, this is clam. So a lot of these sharks in here love to eat squid, clam, and shrimp. So that's what we're gonna do right now. And I'm just gonna toss in some of this in a scatter feed. So we do something called a broadcast feed or a scatter feed where I'm simply just throwing in the food because these guys are really good at finding food on their own. They're relying on their senses and I don't really have to target feed them, meaning I don't have to put it right near their mouth for them to find it. They'll swim around and find the food pretty well on their own. Okay. Okay. Aquarium, and we're gonna catch some plankton today. First of all, you need some tools to catch the plankton. You need your plankton net, um, which has this bottle. It's called the caught end. Like when you catch something, you caught it. So this is the caught end. Then we also need a collecting permit because we will be collecting it. So on this, I have a permit. And then this is our collection jar that we'll be putting the plankton in, okay? Estamos aquí a Cabrillo Beach, donde hay dos mareas altas, dos mareas bajas, casi todos los días. Como tú puedes imaginar, la marea alta es cuando la agua está creciendo más alto en la playa y la marea baja es cuando está bajando más cerca a la mar. Es muy interesante cuando tú tienes una oportunidad para ver los cosas que están dejando por la marea alta. A veces encontramos algas, a veces encontramos conchas, piedras, rojas, cáscaras de animales, basura también. Pero vamos a mirar qué está aquí hoy.
Thank you again to our friends at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium for being a part of today's event. Fun fact, they are the only free aquarium in the U.S. that is accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. The facility is open from noon till 5, Wednesdays through Sundays. Next up is the water group from the Port's Environmental Management Division. The group measures the water and sediment quality around the port complex, which encompasses 43 miles of waterfront. Why does the port measure so much water? How is the measuring done? Who does it? Here to answer those questions and show how water is measured is Christian Centeno. Take it away, Christian. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me. My name is Christian Centeno and I am a environmental specialist with the Port of Los Angeles. And more specifically, I work for the Water Quality and Biological Resources Group and the Environmental Management Division. Now, what does the Water Quality and Biological Resources Group do? Well, we are here to improve the water quality in the port as well as the sediment by performing biological studies on the water, sediment, and biology, as well as uh, giving education and outreach to our local industrial and commercial facilities to try to prevent any type of pollution or contamination of our harbor waters. Now, what do we do to, to study the water? Well, we do biological surveys. We also do hydrodynamic surveys. So we, we do surveys to look at how the water moves in and outside of the port through tidal influxes. And by that, we can see how pollution moves in and out of the harbor. And from there, we do specialized studies to, to, to look at exactly the hotspots of contamination. So if we, through our studies, if we determine there's a hot spot, then we'll go to that location and we'll take samples of the water and the sediment to look at what pollutants are, are in those samples, what the sources are, and how we can remediate that. Now, another uh, studies that we do is when there's construction going on here at the port. So when there's construction such as dredging, and dredging is a special word saying that we're gonna remove sediment from the bottom of the seafloor. When we do that type of dredging, we have to do water quality monitoring to make sure that the dredge material is not going to affect the water column and also disperse contaminants that are contained in the sediment out into the environment. Another study that we do is when the port does pile driving work. So what's pile driving? Well, we're here in this dock and the docks are held by piles. These piles are chemically treated with a chemical that prevents the wood from rotting and also prevents animals from burning into the wood and damaging that pile. So whenever we're removing these large piles, sometimes that protective chemical can leach out into the harbor. So whenever we, whenever we do pile driving work, we have to sample the water as they're doing the work. Now I'm gonna demonstrate a sample for you. This is called a Secchi disc. A Secchi disc looks at the water clarity of the water. And we will do this at a reference point at the construction site and then at the actual construction site. So we'll, we'll, we'll sample upstream just to get a, a baseline reference point and then sample directly at the construction site to look at the difference in water clarity. We also do many other types of testing, such as we look at dissolved oxygen, we look at pH, temperature, depth, we look at salinity, and also turbidity. Now this is an analog version of turbidity. Normally we test on a vessel uh, with vessel mounted equipment that tests digitally. We can look at uh, percent transmittance of turbidity, turbidity, but in this method we're using an analog version and we're looking at just that water cl clarity at the depth. So I'm gonna demonstrate how we do this. What we do is we have this plastic disc and it has a weight down, down at the bottom and then this allows the disc to, to drop into the water. And as I lower it, on the rope there's notches. Here's the first notch. This, uh, this is for five feet. Each notch is five feet. So I'm gonna lower, I'm gonna lower the disc down to where I cannot see it. Once I cannot see it, then I'm gonna raise it up and I'm gonna measure that, that measurement. That's gonna tell me the clarity of the water by depth. So here we have five feet, 10 feet, and I can still see the disc. I'm looking down, I still see it. Now we're at 15 feet. and I cannot see it anymore. So we're about 15 feet and a half. So I'm gonna mark that measurement. 
And now I'm gonna bring it back up just slightly until I can see the, the Seki disc once again. And then I'm gonna take the measurement there. And there it is. So I'm at about 15 and a quarter, so 15.25. So now I'm gonna take the average of the two readings and that tells me the water clarity in, in, in the harbor. Now I would test at the, again, the reference site to, to have a baseline and I would check at the project site to see a comparison of how our construction is impacting the water quality. So thank you for your time, everybody. I appreciate it. Again, uh, if you have any further questions, you can contact the Environmental Management Division at the Port of LA. My name is Christian and thank you for your time. See ya. Thank you again to Christian and the Water Group for showing us how to measure water using the Secchi Disc. A couple fun facts. The Secchi Disc was created by Angelo Secchi, an Italian Jesuit priest. The first Secchi depth was marked at 43 centimeters on April 20th, 1865. Who knew? Moving things along, we welcome our friends from the California Science Center to today's event. The educators at the Science Center will explore how the James Webb Space Telescope sees using different types of light. Let's dive in. Hi, my name is Elaine, and I'm an educator here at the California Science Center. We are a free nonprofit museum in Los Angeles, California in Exposition Park. I am here in our air and space gallery to explore something we experience every day, light. When we think of light, we may think of something like a light bulb, but there are many different types of light. All light moves in waves. Some light moves in fast waves with short wavelengths, and some light moves slowly with long wavelengths. Differences in speed cause the different types of light. For example, fast short waves create light we see as purple, and long slow waves create light we see as the color red. But there are even more types of light laid out here in what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. All of these types of light have different purposes in different types of spacecraft. The James Webb Telescope will use radio waves to send information back to Earth. It will use infrared waves to pick up distant celestial events with its detectors. It will use this type of light to see details in stars and celestial events to possibly give us new information. Let's find out more about how the James Webb Telescope will use infrared light. Hi, my name is Shijia, and I'm a systems engineer on the James Webb Space Telescope. Do you know how old the universe is? Based on data collected from the Planck spacecraft, scientists estimate our universe to be 13.8 billion years old. As the universe expands, so does light. The light traveling from the first stars and galaxies becomes redshifted meaning that the light waves are stretched and move into the red part of the light spectrum. To detect this faint light, we need an infrared telescope. While Hubble observes light primarily in the visible part of the spectrum, with some near-infrared capability, Webb will observe light in the infrared. It is a time machine. With this advanced technology, it will be able to peer back over 13 and a half billion years to when the first stars and galaxies formed, and capture the baby pictures of our universe. Webb is equipped with a large 6.5 meter diameter mirror, composed of 18 individual hexagonal pieces coated with gold to improve the reflection of infrared light. A large mirror helps collect more light, therefore producing more detailed images. Webb will unlock the mysteries of our universe and discover our origin story with the help of four science instruments, the NIRCAM, the NIRSPEC, MIRI, and NIRIS. Together, these instruments will help us understand how galaxies formed and evolved over billions of years, peer through clouds of dust that are impenetrable to visible light observatories such as Hubble, to observe stellar nurseries where new stars and planetary systems are formed, study the atmosphere and learn about the physical properties of exoplanets in an effort to find a planet similar to our home, Earth, and discover the first light of our universe. Wow, thank you Shijia for that awesome information. Here on Earth, we can experience different wavelengths of light, too. I have these different filters that change how we see the light around us. Let's see how the Science Center looks through these filters.
now you try. Take a walk through your home or neighborhood and look through different filters to see how things look. Don't have a filter at home? Try making your own. All you need is two or more clear cups, some water, two colors of food coloring, and something to stir with. Fill the cups about halfway with water. Add a few drops of food coloring to each cup and stir. Look through the water at different drawings, printed pictures, or anything else you find. Thanks for exploring different types of light with me. We hope you can come visit us in person soon. Enjoyed this video? Visit our website at www.californiasciencecenter.org for more free and fun hands-on activities and content. Thank you to Elaine and Sajia for showing us how to use different filters to see light at home. The activity sheet for filtering light is available for download on our STEM Fun Shop landing page, which can be found in the description below. Up next are the port pilots who are on standby and ready to show us the equipment they use when out on the waters. Port pilots provide safe and reliable vessel transit for our cargo customers. Each year, the port pilot service navigates approximately 3,600 arriving and departing vessels. Let's explore what they need to succeed at their jobs. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Mayer. I'm a port pilot here with the Port of Los Angeles, and uh, we're here to talk a little bit about what a port pilot is and what they do, and just to give you kind of a brief insight. So, as many of you know, you go into your supermarkets, you go into your stores, you see electronics, you see goods, you see these things on the shelf, and. And surprisingly, they're actually not all here made in the US. So what we do is they get loaded on like ships like this in the background in a containerized cargo from Asia and from Europe, and they get traded. We sell things here and make things here and, and vice versa. So this is what it looks like. This is a container ship. That's a container crane above it. A lot of these goods come in the form of containerized cargo. It gets put on the dock and then filtered off to the rail or local trucking companies. So, how the ship gets from Asia to here, there's a little bit of uh, transit involved, and so that's where we come in. So these ships load in foreign countries, and then they cross the Atlantic or the Pacific you know, via Panama Canal. They come from all over the world from different routes. They get within a couple miles of the Port of Los Angeles, and that's where we come into play. These ships were designed to cross the ocean in a very efficient way, but they're not really designed well to make sharp turns and slow down quickly to get it, uh, into these small areas of the port. So that's where we come in. We're local knowledge experts. We understand all the different depths and all the different contours and all the aids to navigation throughout the area. So we get on board the vessel about four miles from the harbor and we get on board and we have a brief discussion with the master of the ship. We talk about where we're gonna be taking the ship and what type of safety measures and precautions that we're gonna take in order to get the ship from the ocean to the dock safely. And there's a lot of tools and resources that we use in order to do that, so we'll sort of talk about that. In the beginning, when the ship comes in, we get on board a small boat that's called a pilot boat. And that boat takes us here from land at the dock and it brings us out to the ship. In order to protect ourselves from falling in, we have these resources that we bring with us. These are called float coats. They have highly reflective, re retroreflective tape on them so that if we do fall in the water and the lights hit us, they'll shine nice and bright. And they have light beacons that'll go off. And once these light beacons like this, once the water hits them, they start signaling right away and they start doing this. It doesn't seem very bright right now, but at night, these, these lights shine very, very bright and they're able to find us quickly. And the second thing we have with us are our handheld radios. These are VHF radios. They are pre-programmed to all our working frequencies, and we use these to communicate with the other ships within a close proximity to us, and also the tugboats. So as you can see behind me, there may be some tugboats passing along. The tugs are used for a number of reasons, one being safety and two being control. Like I said before, these ships were designed across the ocean in a very effective way, but they're not really good for short-term maneuvering. 
So the tugboats come into play. As we enter into the breakwater, the tugs come in, they put lines up and that get attached to the ship and we could use the tugs to slow the speed of the ship for braking and we could use the tugs to push us and pull us to control the rate of turn which will ultimately control the another way of steering the ship. So we get on board the ship, we talk to the master, there's a brief conversation about where we're going to go, what side we're going to tie up. We make sure that everything works okay with the ship. It's one of the first questions we ask. As soon as we find out that the ship's okay and there's nothing wrong with it, we can proceed to port safely. It's exactly what we do. So we come into the breakwater, come into the channel. We make passing arrangements with any other vessels that may be in the harbor. And one of the resources we have for that is a safe navigation system. This is called Trailer Brog. We use this. It's called a pilot mate. And what it does is this is an external antenna we bring out there with us. It, it turns on, it works with the, uh, the electronics that are already on the ship. And the reason why these are so handy is because in the event that there's something wrong with the ship, these electronic devices work standalone, meaning we will still be able to safely navigate and we'll still be able to see the vessels in the other area and what their speeds are. Because unlike a, a normal situation like an airplane, they have air traffic control that sort of tells the airplanes what to do and what speeds to go at and what altitudes to be. We really don't have the traffic separation you know, control like they do. We make those determinations. We talk to the other pilots and we talk to the other vessels and we work out how we're gonna safely meet and how we're gonna safely transit through the channels so that there's like no issues. So these iPads that we have, are a great tool, a great resource. It gives us all the navigable, navigation information that we need. It gives us our speed, it gives us our rate of turn. It tells us you know, where we'll meet other vessels within a close proximity, and it's a very useful tool for a pilot. You could get a lot of information from it really quickly, and then you could set it back down and just focus on what you're doing around you. You're giving the helmsman orders, he's steering the ship just like you would steer your car. So you're able to multitask, have a great deal of information, just to swipe away, and also maintain safe navigation of the vessel. You got a couple guys on board or girls that are on the ship with you that help you out. They're called the bridge team. You form a bond with that bridge team and it's called bridge resource management. So I'm watching the helmsman, making sure that the helmsman does what I'm supposed to do or making sure that he does what I tell him to do. The captain is watching me watching me navigate his ship, making sure that I'm making the right decision. So it's a lot of, uh, you know, oversight and that's for safety. In case I miss something, the captain's there to say something. In case the helmsman miss something, I'm there to say something to him. And that's how we work and that's how we safely get the ships to the dock. If you have any questions or any comments or if you guys want to reach out, the information will be at the bottom of the link. Please don't hesitate. You guys have a safe day. Thank you to Captain Meyer for showing us the essential tools every port pilot needs. On behalf of the captain, I would like to plug his appearance on Career Report, our YouTube educational series where he answers questions submitted by students. Spoiler alert, port pilots make anywhere between $200,000 to $500,000 a year. You can watch his interview here. Now those who visited the port and taken our boat tours will remember seeing a group of sea lions hanging out on the buoys. While I enjoy seeing them, I seem to ask myself, what's the difference between a sea lion and a seal again? Let Dave Bader at the Marine Mammal Care Center explain. Dave! Hi, and welcome to the Marine Mammal Care Center in sunny Southern California here in San Pedro. My name is Dave. I'm the Chief Operations and Education Officer here at the Marine Mammal Care Center. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about how can we tell the difference between both seals and sea lions. We're a seal and sea lion hospital and we care for both of those types of animals. Right behind me right now, we have California sea lions. They're not technically seals, they're sea lions. And how do we know that? Well, we can look at their faces and they have ear flaps. So if you're gonna buy a pair of earrings, for a seal or a sea lion. It's only gonna work for a sea lion, not a seal. Now they both have ears, but only the sea lions have the ear flaps. Now another way you can look and find the difference between a seal and a sea lion is in the way that they move around on land and the way that they swim in the water. <laughs> sea lions have large front flippers. 
uh, and they use those to sort of swim through the water with their front flippers. And they can also use those to walk about on land while they also rotate their rear flippers underneath their body. Sea lions are much more agile on land than seals are because of that. Now, the last difference, and this is the one I think is most fun, is that sea lions are, are really kind of much more social. They like to swim around, chase each other, bark, do all of those kinds of things. Um, and that's definitely one of the ways that you can tell you're looking at a California sea lion. They also have this rich, dark brown color um, that also sets them apart a little bit. Now in our other pens and other animals that we treat here are actually true seals. We have both harbor seals occasionally, but predominantly we have northern elephant seals. Northern elephant seals can be told from sea lions because again, can't buy them earrings. They lack these things on the outside, but they do have ears. Um, they have these really large eyes as well. But the main difference is in how they move about. Now in the water, you're gonna be able to tell a northern elephant seal by the way it swims in the water. They use their rear flippers, not their front flippers, to kick back and forth, sort of like a fish, to swim. Very different than a sea lion. And when they come out on land, that's the big difference. Seals, they can't rotate those rear flippers underneath their body. So when they move about on land, they kind of have to inch around on the ground like a worm. We call that galumphing, uh, which is a nice word, just means kind of inching around on the ground on your belly. Uh, so those are the main differences between uh, seals and sea lions and how you can look at them. Uh, some behavioral differences, well, sea lions, they typically can't hold their breath for quite as long as an, uh, a seal, and especially not as long as uh, northern elephant seals, which can hold their breath for over an hour. Whereas California sea lions, maybe 15 minutes max, and much more common to have them just diving under the surface for a few minutes at a time. Now here at the Marine Mammal Care Center, we're a hospital for seals and sea lions. And predominantly we get sick and injured animals that have come in for a whole lot of different reasons. One of the uh, most common reasons why we get a patient here at the Marine Mammal Care Center is because of malnutrition. Uh, when, they're, when they're born, mammals drink milk from their moms and it's true of seals and sea lions. Now that milk from a seal or a sea lion mom can be really rich, sometimes up to 50% fat. And they grow big and they grow fast, um, but then their moms leave and once they're weaned, they're not drinking mom's milk anymore. It's up to those young animals to find fish and forage on their own out in the ocean. And for some of them, they just aren't able to find enough food. And so they're not able to thrive out in the ocean. That's right, we'll take care of it. Um, so, so what do we do? Well, those animals come in and they are very skinny. They've lost their blubber layer. Now their blubber is an adaptation that helps to keep them warm in the cold waters that they live, but they're also an energy reserve. And so if they're not getting a chance to eat, they're gonna be using up that energy reserve uh, while also becoming you know, malnourished. And really critically, seals and sea lions get fresh water from the foods that they eat. So an animal that's out at sea and it's not getting a chance to eat is going to be dehydrated as well. So those are some of the main conditions we get through those uh, weaned animals that have gone to sea and then just couldn't get enough to eat. Now we get other types of animals in here as well that have uh, become injured or, or sick for different reasons. Sometimes it's because of parasites. Sometimes it's because of a shark attack. Uh, we get some shark bites in here as well. And we also get animals that have become entangled in, in plastics and fishing gear and that sort of thing. Those are all different conditions that we can treat for here. And with all of that, we make sure we give all of the animals that you see behind me and that you've seen today um, the best chance at survival out there in the ocean. Well, I hope you learned a little bit about the difference between seals and sea lions. My name is Dave. Thanks for visiting us here at the Marine Mammal Care Center. Thank you for the insight, Dave. Big thanks also go out to the Marine Mammal Care Center team and the work they do to rehabilitate seals and sea lions. The center has educational tours on weekends, so be sure to reserve a spot and take some time to visit the mammals. And one last trip to the port we go. On this final stop, we will check in with Port Police and Officer Dong Lee, who is a part of the Hazardous Materials Unit. What tech equipment does Officer Lee use out on the field? Let's go see. Hi, my name is Dong Lee. I'm a hazmat investigator for the Port Police. 
I'm here to show you what I do every day for the Port of Los Angeles using science and technology. Uh, what I have today here is examples of uh, equipment that we use. Um, these equipments help me identify unknown chemicals out in the field when we are dealing with container spills or um, other terrorist threats, including uh, unknown materials that gets delivered through our mail, uh, which has been done in the past against the politicians and important people using anthrax and uh, biological materials to uh, scare people, pretty much. And we, our job here is to make sure that it's okay for us to handle or for other people to handle and it's not going to harm anybody. And these are the equipments that's going to help me to determine whether it's going to be harmful or it's okay, we can pick it up and clean up. So I'm cutting the envelope on the side and usually where people don't expect to be cut, just in case there's a booby trap or any other mechanism that may spread this white powder from inside. So I'm gonna cut slowly from the side to check to make sure that I can get a good sample from the envelope of the white powder or the suspicious items. Now that I've collected a sample from the envelope, I can use these two machines that uses laser technology to identify what this is and let me know if this in fact is a, a threat to people that's gonna harm people or if it's gonna be safe for us to clean up and it's a, sometimes it's a practical joke or some crazy people will send uh, mails to scare people. So we can um, tell people that it's okay, it's not gonna be harmful or hurt you. This is a Rogaku. Um, as you can see, it uses a laser. It's gonna shoot a very strong laser through here and let me know and let's see what it says. So it will take a few seconds to a minute to get the, um, the signal or the laser signal back from the material. And it's like a, it has a little computer inside, stores a lot of data. It will basically compare pictures of graphs that it has and what it says from the material and it will match it up and it will let me know, hey, there's a match, and let me know what it is. So I have the results. Basically, it says no threat, which means it's probably something that that's not gonna hurt you immediately. And most of the times, it will give me a lot of scientific names for different chemicals, and I have to determine, okay, what matches the best. And this is one technology that we use so when we're not sure, it's like, hey, this is giving me so many different results. What else can I do? I can use another machine actually to test and give me more assurance to know that, hey, I've done everything right, but I wanna be making sure that this is not gonna hurt anybody. They're both uh, very similar in that they use lasers and different um, lights to bounce things off of the unknown material to acquire, but they have a different uh, technology so that one may be better at getting And as you can see, it's, it only requires a little bit. I don't need to pour the whole thing because it'll be a bad thing to spread around. 
these little granulates everywhere and spill it. Maybe just a tad bit more. And once again, it will take a few minutes for us to get the results. And meanwhile, we don't totally rely on the machines. Sometimes machines do make mistakes. So we would go through uh, user science, like the pH paper. I'm sure if you're in the science, you will run into them a lot. These are strips of papers that we can dip in to show you how acidic or base it is, how dangerous it is, if it's gonna eat up your, uh, your skin. And this one doesn't have any alerts because, like I said, these two machines uh, work differently. And this, this machine does not do well with the crystals. So you can have different shapes of these powders. Um, and now I know for sure that because it doesn't have the database in here. It also tells me that there's a lot of salt-like material here. So it's gonna be like a salt. And in this one, I should kind of confirm that earlier, that it was salt. So even if the machine doesn't say, hey, I know what this is, it also tells me by not telling me anything that this is most likely salt. And there we have it. We have a table salt, and I've used these uh, machines that use technology laser technology and computerized technology to find out that this is unharmful letter. So again, uh, my name is Officer Dong Lee of the LA Port Police Hazmat Unit. That was my demonstration on two of our hazmat ID or field ID equipment that we use. And follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Lee, for walking us through the simulation and showcasing the latest tech equipment that Port Police use in such situations. Special thank yous go out to all of the Port civilian and sworn officers and the various units that protect the Port and keep our communities safe and sound. Finally, thank you for staying with us and watching until the very end. Be sure to visit the STEM Fun Shop landing page where you can rewatch the presentations and download the resources highlighted throughout the event. We hope to bring our in person STEM Fun Shop back in 2023. But until we are able to see each other in person, please stay safe and healthy. Goodbye, everyone.